Welcome and thank you for joining today's conference, HUD Grant Writing and Capacity Development Training. Before we begin, please ensure you have opened the chat panel by using the associated icon located at the bottom of your screen. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. To submit a written question, select all panelists from the drop-down menu in the chat panel, enter your question in the message box provided, and send. The slide decks will be available after the webinar, and it will also be available in three weeks on the HUD Exchange website at https colon forward slash forward slash www.hudexchange.info forward slash programs forward slash envision hyphen centers forward slash. To minimize the background noise on this call, please ensure that your audio device is muted. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. With that, I'll turn the call over to Anne Davis from the HUD Richmond office. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Shreyas. And again, I want to thank the CISO uh, WebEx uh, Envision our, um, platform and all of the event producers who have worked with us this week. Um, you've just been wonderful, and we've, we've really been uh, very, very happy with the partnership that we've had. So before we get into today's uh, work, I wanted to make sure that we had all of the questions from uh, yesterday uh, answered. So Hidayah is going to um, jump in there with some of those before we even do that. So I wanted to point out to you in the chat box, you will see that I did find HUD's highest scoring funding applications. Now, the last ones that were added to that list were from 2014, but the concepts are the same. Uh, turns out they moved them over to the uh, Freedom of Information Act um, frequently requested materials uh, page, and that's why I couldn't find them and why you couldn't find them on the, uh, on the grants office. Um, and I also added, I had been asked for some sources for data for your needs assessment. So I've put in a list of uh, places where you can start looking for uh, needs data and statistical data to uh, help you support your needs assessment and, um, and talk to you about, you know, how you're, gonna, how you're gonna say what impact issues are having in your community. So I hope that these are helpful to you. And uh, Hidayah, if you would just go ahead with any questions that we didn't get to from yesterday, because we were bumping right up against the clock yesterday afternoon. All right, thank you, Anne. I'll start with the first one. Um, I see someone asked, is it easier for grant applications if under United Way, though League City, Texas doesn't have a United Way as it's only uh, 120,000 people in their population, and they're saying, is partnering with larger organizations helpful on grants? Well, you know, I, I'm not sure it's necessarily, you know, that you need to partner with the United Way. It, it, one thing a United Way can do for an organization is help provide some of that additional um, technical type assistance, like with board training and uh, strategic planning training. Um, and they're also a wonderful resource to get out into the community. Uh, but if you don't have a United Way, um, try to find out who else in your community is providing services and pull yourselves together as a group so that you can support each other and work together and that when you do uh, submit an application, you're actually, you're actually working as a unified community. 120,000 is not that small of a community, so I'm sure that you've got some nonprofits that are working there uh, in addition to yourself. But I think the thing to do is to, is to, is to get, get together with each other, have a, you know, a brown bag lunch or a, you know, a brown bag lunch via Zoom right now, but connect with each other. Find out what each other does so that, number one, you're not duplicating each other's work, 
but number two, so you can support each other and use each other's expertise in different um, services that you provide. Okay, thank you, Ann. Um, and then the third part of our question was, do, does an organization need to have a website for grant eligibility and area presence for grants? I don't know that you actually need to have a website for grant eligibility. Not not aware of any requirement that says that. Although certainly um, it's a good idea that you. I mean, you know, you should be able to to do that again uh, by banding together with a local group of nonprofit organizations or human service organizations, and you might, you know, put you know a whole county nonprofit network type of situation up and then you can you can have a page on a, on a network like that uh, but I'm not aware of any requirement that you have a website to be eligible for grant funding uh, you do have to have technological capability though I'm going to tell you that right off the top if, if you don't have technological capability to submit grant applications, if you don't have technological capability to receive information, uh, you are you're kind of pretty far behind the eight ball as it is. And you need to get that um, beefed up as much as possible. And that needs to be a priority expenditure for your organization. Thank you, Anne. Um, and then these Next few questions, um, maybe you may have addressed, although I do see some questions in the chat coming up. So someone asked, what was the website for HUD research information? Someone else said, what are effective ways of data collection? And another similar question is, can you repeat the websites of the public studies mentioned for a literature search? Okay, um, I don't know that I mentioned specific studies for literature search. That would be, you would go to your uh, your area of expertise and see what has been put into the literature for that particular area. If you look at the chat room, I did put down some sources for data, uh, and that includes city and county websites, city county consolidated plans, which are usually available through the city manager or county administrator's uh, web pages, universities and colleges, especially ones that have public policy and government programs, census.gov, HUDUser.gov, that's the HUD PD and our website that I know I did mention, and there's literature for housing on that one. Um, local and state departments of health and education and local and state public safety programs, just to name a few. And I think as you let your, your brain roll around this a little bit, you will think of some more places where you might be able to uh, pull some data information. And then again, uh, to uh, to remind you, if you wanted to see some successful grant applications uh, above that sources for data in the chat room, I have listed HUD's highest scoring funding applications. The last ones added were from 2014, and that is on our Freedom of Information Act uh, frequently requested materials page. Uh, but I put the link there for you so that you can find it. A few people are saying that they're not seeing um, this information in the chat, so. Oh, I sent it to all attendees. So I will resend it. Um, I'll, I'll repost it at the end of this presentation. Just make sure everybody has it. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not seeing in the chat the information I'm referred to. Did you click on the little arrow next to the word chat to open it up? I'm not sure if you're asking me. Well, um, I, I guess I'm asking whoever, uh, who is it, Wanda, who says she's not seeing it in, yet, not seeing in the chat. There's a little arrow next to chat that needs to be pointing down to open up the chat box. Actually, Anne, um, looks like you posted the information uh, before many people joined the WebEx. So uh, when they join the WebEx late, they'll not be able to see the older messages, so you may want to post the information uh, yeah. again now. Yeah, to Absolutely. all the attendees. Absolutely, I, I will post it right now. Let's see if we can hit paste. Yes, okay. And there you go. I just posted it again, my friends, so hopefully you'll be able to see it. 
Thank okay. you. Great. Um, so this next question is, where does the grant writer fee go in the budget if it is contracted? If, most, most of the time, you are not allowed to uh, use a grant writer fee as an expense. That is not an eligible expense. I've, in fact, I've never seen uh, a grant application that allowed a grant writer fee as an eligible expense. That is something you have to pay off the top, and you may or may not get your application funded. So it is, it's, it's a gamble, to, and you will pay thousands of dollars to a grant writer who may or may not get your application funded, which is why I always say, hey, you know, you, you may not need to use a grant writer. Now, I have nothing against grant writers, and they are, they are a worthy profession, and they certainly meet a need. But if you can't afford to pay one up front, then you may have to figure out a way to do this yourself, and that's what I'm here to try and help you learn to do. And if you follow some of the steps we went through yesterday for the five um, main elements that every fund, every funder is looking for, um, and, and you know, setting yourself up with a good system of getting all of the pieces in, then I think you will find that you can do this even if you're a small organization. Um, and you may want to start with some smaller grants and work your way up to some larger grants. And certainly um, with federal funding, start as a subgrantee with your community. Funny thing, just today, in uh, the, I, I kind of go through the, the HUD news clips uh, for our region every day. And uh, just today there was a news clip from a uh, community here in Virginia that is advertising that it is taking applications from nonprofits in their community for community development block grant funds that they get from HUD. So they're looking to subgrant. That is a great way to get your feet wet in the federal funding world is to be a subgrantee that way. Uh, I also got another, you know, you just need to start opening yourselves up to an information flow because I got another uh, newsletter from a, a different, um, like a community foundation that uh, was that listed two grant opportunities that it had available. One, which I thought was absolutely wonderful, it was funding that it got from uh, Facebook, and it is uh, is doing a uh, a black community uh, issues grant that it's putting out. So you know the the funding is out there. Just open yourself up to it. Again, if you can get some college interns. This is a wonderful place to ask your college interns to help you because they're, they have a tendency to be just a touch more fluent than somebody my age uh, is. Uh, I have to maybe spend a little more time on some of these things that, um, that some of my younger friends can get to very quickly and their fingers are moving so quickly. So, uh, but yeah, if you can get some college interns to help you do this research, this would be awesome. Okay. Thank you, Anne. Sure. Um, so the next question, uh, two parts. The first part, they're praising you for the workshop and your expertise. Um, the you. second part, they, uh, they're asking, so funding used to be 80% government and 20% other sources. Is that still correct? It's going to depend on the, uh, on the investor and what they're funding. Some of HUD's uh, programs require a 25% match. Uh, some of them like that, the, uh, the outline that's in the handout uh, for the day two stuff, which is, you know, from, from yesterday on, uh, you'll find that they didn't require any match at all, but they do give points for leveraging. So it is, it is a grant by grant thing. And here's another reason why it is very, very important for you to read every single word of the Notice of Funding Availability, HUD has actually changed the name to Notice of Funding Opportunity, so from no fuss to no foe. Uh, but uh, read every word, and then go back and read it again with the highlighter in your hand, and then go back and read it a third time and take what you highlighted and put it into a checklist or an outline form so that you make sure you really understand what's being asked for. Because, um, yeah, um, it's going to depend on the grant as to how much match they want. Thank you, Anne. 
Someone is asking, is it okay to hire a grant writer and pay them after the grant is received if that, indiv if that individual agrees to that with the knowledge that he or she may not be paid if the grant is not awarded? I guess if you can negotiate something like that, sure. Um, you, you probably still won't be able to pay them out of the grant. You would have to find other funds to pay them with because uh, that would not be an eligible expense under the grant. But if, if you can negotiate that with the grant writer, so sure, why not? Um, I don't think you'll need to, but, you know, if you think you need to and, and, you can, and you can get a grant writer to work with you on that basis, then sure. Thank you, Ann. Next question says, would you suggest the final draft writer is the same person that wrote the first draft? Also, the final draft writer, sorry, also should the final draft writer be one of the team that works on the application development or an outside person? Um, not necessarily would be my answer to either one, to both of those uh, parts of that question. Um, you know, your final draft writer, that's actually going to be your submission copy, so that's going to be your best writer. It doesn't necessarily have to be the same one who worked on preliminary drafts, although it's helpful because that person might have used, you know, things that they understand that they might have to take time to explain to somebody else. Um, so, you know, with, with regard to, to the final submission, you know, it should be written by one person. Maybe it's somebody who's been on the team. Maybe it's somebody who's not on the team but who's been given access to the materials that the team has pulled together. You have to do what works best for your organization, okay? And so you might have you might have a a, a journalism major, you know, who's who's working as a volunteer, who's not on your board, who's not on the team but who can pull together this information and have a clear understanding and write it clearly. So it's, it's going to be who do, who do you have, what skills do you have that you can tap into. Thank you, Ann. The next question is, you have mentioned United Way as the go-to group for help with technical assistance. How do groups like www.pfccoalition.org get connected with HUD as a resource for nonprofits? Okay, P I'm not sure what pfccoalition.org is off the top of my head, but um, how you connect with HUD is, uh, is by getting to know somebody at HUD and seeing if that person can, can um, guide you towards some resources. Please keep in mind that nobody at HUD is going to be able to review your application. Nobody at HUD is going to be able to, uh, to help you with your grant writing. That's not something we're allowed to do. But if you're asking us to help you find some resources, um, you know, if we have time, we're able to, sure, we would do that. I certainly have done that many times for different organizations. Um, so, uh, you know, get to know people at your HUD office. I would say start with your, um, your front office. The people who work with your uh, with your HUD offices, every every state has a HUD office. Uh, some of them have more than one, um, and and start with the people in the director's office, and uh, and ask them, you know, do they do they know of any resource you could go to, or can do they know of anyone who can guide you to resources? And see what they say. You know, a lot, a lot of people, uh, like like my friend Catherine in San Antonio, and uh, and the team that she works with there, uh, Robert Johnson and Jerlinda Banks, they know a lot of the resources. Uh, others are very small offices, and they may not know, know so many resources, but they might be able to put you in touch with somebody. So I would say get to know the folks. Thanks, Ann. This next question says. Please repeat where to find funded grants on grants.gov. Okay. You won't find funded grants on grants.gov, and I'm sorry that that, that that was not clear. Where you will find funded grants is on this HUD website that I just posted again to the chat box, okay, and it's 
and it is in the uh, HUD uh, Freedom of Information Act frequently requested materials. The link is there in the chat box, so please do look, okay? Um, but that is where you will find HUD's highest scoring funding applications. The last ones were posted from 2014. Don't let that throw you, okay? The, the, um, the concept behind putting together a good grant application don't change that much over a period of years. The, 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 um, the technicalities might, but the concepts behind putting together an application are going to stay pretty consistent. So go to, uh, go to that link that I put in the chat box, and underneath that link you will find sources for data for developing your needs assessment. Now, I couldn't give you specific ones because this workshop is going up across the entire country. Um, that's why we have it so late in the afternoon on the, on the East Coast so that our folks, friends on the West Coast, can uh, not have to click on it at 6 in the morning. Um, so, you know, I, I couldn't put a lot of specific sources for data down there, but, but there are, you know, a lot of sources for data. And I'll be giving you a few more uh, places to start at the end of the uh, presentation today. And this is the last question, just to follow up to earlier. Where okay. do I find the news? Sorry, where do I find the newsletter for Black nonprofits you just mentioned? The new, it's not a newsletter for Black nonprofits. Okay, it is a uh, a local organization that um, a local community foundation that put out a, a notice of funding availability for this local community here in Virginia. So if you're not in Virginia, it's probably not going to be real helpful to you, but it is the, um, the Hampton Roads uh, Community Foundation, and they put out a Black Community Partnership Fund uh, notice of funding availability, and that is funded through uh, Facebook. So it was one of 20 community foundations across the country that received funding from Facebook for this type of activity. It's called the Black Community Partnership Fund org. And I'm sure if you look it up, you can see if there's anything in your community that might be similar or you might be able to, you know, follow some links to, to, to get you to some information um, that can help you start something like that in your community. But I just got so excited when, I mean, here I was just getting ready for our last day of this webinar, and two funding announcements came across my email within minutes of each other. This one for the, uh, the Southampton Road Community Foundation, and um, then this other one for the City of Hopewell for the Community Development Block Grant. So that's what I mean about keeping your eyes open, paying attention, having a good environmental awareness. What is going on around you? What is the news flow? Somebody has to be keeping track of the news flow. Okay, I wouldn't have seen that Hopewell um, notice if I hadn't been doing my daily news tracking thing that I did. It would have gone right by me. Wouldn't have paid attention to it. So somebody needs to do that. Somebody in your organization. It can be a board member. It can be an intern. It can be just a volunteer, but you need to be able to count on somebody to keep their finger on the pulse of what's going on in the news in your community and in your state. So that said, are we ready to jump off for today? Yes, I hope so. Okay. <laughs> Listen, these are important questions, and I never want you to think that I did not want to take the time to respond to this, okay? Uh, but today we're going to start with HUD's place-based initiatives. Now, a lot of you are working in some of these programs, so these are going to sound very familiar to you. Some of you, though, are working in one program and not realizing how these programs can dovetail with each other. And that's one of the things that we wanted to highlight for you today. So. Um, Shreyas, if you would just go ahead and advance the slide, thank you. All right, so we're going to start with Section 3, and, and I can almost see Hedaya uh, grinning now because uh, on Wednesday, Hedaya and our uh, colleague 
um, Megan and uh, some of the folks in Central Virginia and I actually did a Section 3 workshop for the housing authorities in the Central Virginia area. What is Section 3? It's a provision of the Housing and Urban Development Act of 1968 that, that ensures a preference for employment, training, and contracting opportunities generated from the expenditure of certain HUD funds and that it's those opportunities are directed to low and very low income persons, especially those who receive federal housing assistance and for businesses that are owned by or substantially employ people like that. The final Section 3 rule was just published in the Federal Register on September 29, 2020. So we, from about 1994 until September 29, 2020, we were operating on what was called an interim rule. And that interim rule was pretty good, and it, and, it, and it held a lot of great information. But this is the final rule. It became effective on November 30th, 2020, and all of our uh, grantees who received the particular kinds of funds that are covered, and this is public housing funds, this is uh, lead-based paint abatement funds, and this is um, community planning and development funds above a certain threshold, uh, all of those grantees are required to be in compliance with this final rule on starting on their first fiscal year, their first full fiscal year after this coming July. So they have up until July to kind of get their brains around how they're going to do it, and do their outreach to the businesses and get more businesses signed up on the Section 3 registry. And, get their, um, their Section 3 workers, you know, ready with resumes posted to the Opportunity Portal and things like that. And, and then whatever fiscal year starts for them on July 1st, 2021, and afterwards, then that's when they need to be in compliance. Next slide, please, Shreya. Okay, the Section 3 final rule improves effectiveness by focusing reporting on key outcome metrics like how many new hires have you got? How many of the uh, labor hours are being performed by Section 3 workers? Those kinds of things. It aligns the reporting with standard business practices. It promotes sustained employment and career development, and this is really important. It changes the threshold for the Section 3 covered assistance. It redefines Section 3 residents to Section 3 workers and Section 3 businesses. It, it, kind of redefines them a little bit too. Changes in reporting labor hours and new hires. And it has updates that are still coming for the opportunity portal, the business registry, and for their compliance reporting for Section 3. Next slide, please, Sheree. Okay, Envision Centers. And I know that a lot of you are involved with Envision Centers because um, Romel is involved with Envision Centers, and as he's been sending out slides, they've been coming from Envision Centers at HUD.gov. So what are Envision Centers? Envision Centers are centralized hubs that provide people with resources and support needed to excel, and that is the Envision Centers mission statement. Remember we talked about short, sweet, and to the point? What is an Envision Center? The centralized hub that it provides people with resources and support needed to excel. That's the mission statement. The resources are coordinated and centralized through community collaboration with federal partners. And these federal partners can include your uh, Environmental Protection Agency, Department of Commerce, Health and Human Services, Treasury, Labor, Agriculture, Education, the AmeriCorps National Civ Civilian Community Corps, and VISTA. All right, and those are just some, okay? Obviously, HUD's part of this, too, all right? So think about, you know, who, who do you have that's a partner? Um, you know, there, there aren't a lot of uh, communities that have a full scope of federal partners, but there may be some. You may have a small business administration in your community. You may have a Department of Labor, or your Department of Labor may be working with your Department of Workforce services. Find out who are the partners that can link up with you and, and in your envision centers. And then talk to your community. This is a community uh, developed organization. 
that is there to meet the needs of the community and help the people in the community get the resources they need to reach their full capacity. Next slide, please, Therese. The goal of Envision Centers is to empower all people to fulfill their potential by providing the tools they need to succeed. HUD has four pillars that we like to see supported, okay? Economic empowerment, educational advancement, health and wellness, and character and leadership. There's an instruction guide and an application link to becoming an Envision Center, and this is the link where you may find it. And please remember, you will not only be receiving these slides um, this afternoon, Ramel will send them to you, but you will, you will also be able in about three weeks or so go on to the HUD, exchange, the HUD exchange and you will be able to download this presentation and the slides. So you will have access to this information. Next slide, please, Sherry. Opportunity zones. This is something that, that uh, Hidaya and I have been working on a bit over the last year. What are opportunity zones? Opportunity zones are economically distressed communities. I think we all know some of those where we live. They're defined by individual census tracts. They were nominated by America's governors. So HUD didn't choose the opportunity zones. Treasury didn't choose the opportunity zones. The governors chose the opportunity zones. They're certified by the Secretary of the Treasury via his delegation of that authority to the Internal Revenue Service. Under certain conditions, new investments in opportunity, in opportunity zones may be eligible for preferential tax treatment. And a lot of that has to do with a deferment of taxes for capital gains uh, or a reduction in, the, in taxes for capital gains for investments in opportunity zone projects. There were 8,700 plus opportunity zones in the United States, many of which have, have experienced a lack of investment for decades. Opportunity zones initiative is an incentive. It's an incentive to spur private and public investment in underserved communities. You can find out more about opportunity zones at opportunityzones.hud.gov. Next slide, please, Shreya. Promise zones. What are promise zones? Promise zones are high poverty communities where the federal government partners with local leaders to increase economic activity. Do you hear, do you hear a recurrent theme here, my friends? Improve educational opportunities, leverage private investment, reduce violent crime, enhance public health, and address other priorities identified by the community. Next slide, please. There are 22 urban, rural, and tribal promise zones that were selected through three rounds of national competition. Applicants had to demonstrate a consensus vision for their community and its residents, the capacity to carry it out, and a shared commitment to specific, measurable results. The promise zone designation lasts for a term of 10 years and there is a link here with more information about promise zones. You may not have a promise zone in your community, but you may be near to one. You may find that, that the opportunity exists for you to throw in with an opportunity zone and help them achieve some of their goals at the same time you're achieving some of your goals. Next slide, please, Sharia. Choice neighborhoods. What are choice neighborhoods? Choice Neighborhoods Program leverages significant public and private dollars to support locally driven strategies that address struggling neighborhoods with distressed public or HUD assisted housing through a comprehensive approach to neighborhood transformation. What does that say in non government speak? It's a program that pulls in public and private dollars to, to make the communities vibrant again, okay? Make public uh, housing neighborhoods and other communities nearby vibrant and healthy again. Local leaders, residents, and stakeholders such as public housing authorities, cities, schools, police, business, et cetera, they come together to create and implement a plan that revitalizes the distressed HUD housing 
and addresses challenges in the surrounding neighborhood. It helps communities transform by revitalizing the, the housing and by catalyzing critical improvements in the neighborhood, including dealing with vacant property, housing, businesses, services, and schools. Next slide, please, Sarah. Choice Neighborhoods is focused on three core goals. Housing is the first one because clearly this is housing-centric, okay? Replace distressed public and assisted housing with high-quality, mixed-income housing that is well-managed and responsive to the needs of the neighborhood. <clears throat> People, improve the outcomes of households living in the target housing related to employment and income, health and children's education, and neighborhood. Create the conditions necessary for public and private reinvestment in these neighborhoods to offer the kinds of amenities and assets, including safety, schools, and commercial activity that are important to choice about community. Next slide, please, Sheree. Choice neighborhood, there are, there are 85 choice neighborhood planning grants across the country. They support the development of comprehensive revitalization plans um, that address the three core goals of housing people and neighborhoods. And then there have been 35 implementation grants. And these grants are not chicken feed, my friends. Um, these are like $30 million grants. So if, if, if your community is looking at a choice neighborhood planning grant and wants to move it to the next step to implementation, uh, it's worth everybody's time to get involved in that. Here is a link where you can find more information about choice neighborhoods. Okay, next slide, please. Jobs Plus. What is Jobs Plus? The Jobs Plus initiative program develops locally-based, job-driven approaches to increasing earnings and advanced employment outcomes through work readiness, employer linkages, job placement, educational advancement, technology skills, and financial literacy for residents of public housing. There uh, are 24 Jobs Plus grantees across the country right now. Uh, keep your eyes open to any new uh, notices of funding opportunity that might come out. Jobs Plus incentivizes and enables employment through income disregards for working families so that, that if you are involved in a Jobs Plus program and you earn income through a job, some of that income can be disregarded and not, not, not have your rent increase as a result of having earned that income. And services that are designed to support work, including employer linkages, job placement and counseling, educational advancement, and financial counseling. Next slide, please. The Jobs Plus Initiative Program consists of the following three core components. Employer-related services, financial incentives, and community support for work. And you can find more information about the Jobs Plus Initiative at this link. Next slide, please, Sherea. Connect Home USA, one of my favorites. <laughs> and uh, Connect Home USA was very involved in bringing this webinar to you this week also. What is Connect Home USA? Connect Home USA is a, a public-private collaboration designed to bridge the digital divide for residents living in HUD-assisted housing. Uh, it was led uh, up until recently by a national nonprofit called Everyone On, and U Connect Home USA creates a platform for community leaders, local governments, nonprofits, and private industry to join together and produce locally tailored solutions for building strong digital inclusion programs. And of, you know, of all of the things that needed to happen this year, I'm going to say Connect Home was probably one of the most important things for our children and for their ability to continue to be educated during the time of pandemic. Uh, Connect Home was designed to address the three-legged stool of digital inclusion, which is affordable connectivity, training, and low-cost devices. 
There are 56 participating communities that have helped connect more than 52,000 households to broadband. To learn more about Connect Home USA, please visit the connecthomeusa.org website. Um, you can go to HUD website, hud.gov, and Google Connect Home USA also. And Connect Home USA has a page on the HUD Exchange as well. Um, every community needs Connect Home USA, in my humble opinion. Next slide, please. Resident Opportunity and Self-Sufficiency, Roth. Roth is a program that's been around for quite a long time in HUD. Uh, what is Roth? It's a HUD grant program that funds service coordinators who assess the needs of residents of conventional public housing or Indian housing and coordinate available resources in the community to meet those needs. Roth service coordinators promote the development of local strategies to coordinate the use of assistance under the public housing program with public and private resources with supportive services and resident-empowered activities. Next slide, please. Roth services enable participating families to increase earned income, reduce or eliminate the need for welfare assistance, make progress toward achieving economic independence and housing self-sufficiency, or in the case of elderly or disabled residents, help improve their living conditions and enable residents to age in place. And here is a link for more information about the Roth program. And next slide, please. Family self-sufficiency, another uh, program that has been around for quite a long time. And, and again, I hope you see how these programs can dovetail with each other. What is family self-sufficiency? It's a program that enables cut assisted families to increase their earned income and reduce their dependency on welfare assistance and rental subsidies. The housing authorities work in collaboration with a program coordinating committee to get commitments of public and private resources for the operation of their program and, and to develop their action plan to implement the program. Once an eligible family is selected to participate, they execute a contract that specifies the rights and responsibilities of both the housing authority and the participating family. The term of the contract is usually about five years, but it may be extended uh, for good cause. The Family Self-Sufficiency Contract also incorporates the family's individual training and services plan. That, re that records the plan and the series of intermediate and long-term goals and steps that the family needs to take and those services and resources they need to, act need to access and to achieve those goals. So you see, remember I talked about engaging your uh, customers in developing their service plan? That's really the precept behind family self-sufficiency. You have the participating families that are sitting down with the coordinator saying, okay, here's the goal I'm trying to reach, and these are the steps we can take to get me to these goals. And they're signing off on it. They've had the input on it. When somebody has had the input on what they say they're going to do, they are far more likely to follow it through. Next slide, please. The Family Self-Sufficiency Family Unification Program. It's kind of a, a branch of the Family Self-Sufficiency Program. It's a program under which housing choice vouchers are provided to two different populations. One is families for whom the lack of adequate housing is a primary factor in having a child or children placed out of the home or a delay in the discharge of child or children from out-of-home care. Think of foster care, okay? So the imminent placement of the children in foster care or a delay in getting them out of foster care due to a lack of adequate housing. <clears throat> There's no time limitation on family unification family vouchers. There is another uh, use for the family unification program voucher, and that is for a period not to exceed three years, 36 months, Otherwise eligible youth who have attained at least 18 years of age and not more than 24 years of age and who have left foster care or will leave foster care within 90 days in accordance with a transition plan 
uh, and will be homeless or at risk of becoming homeless, they might be eligible if the uh, housing authority has some family unification vouchers that they can use. For more information about the family self-sufficiency family unification program, uh, you can go to this link. Okay, next slide, please. All right, the final place-based program I wanted to look at today is the Foster Youth to Independence Initiative. It is a pretty new program with HUD, but uh, in the areas where we have implemented this program, it has so far been very successful. What is FYI? It targets housing assistance to young people aging out of foster care who are at extreme risk of experiencing homelessness. It offers housing vouchers to local housing authorities to prevent or end homelessness among young adults under the age of 25 who are or have recently left the foster care system without a home to go to. Here is the link where you can find more information about the FYI initiative. I will tell you as uh, somebody who had the great privilege of fostering some young people uh, over the years, um, I can't think of any of them, none of them, who were ready to be on their own at age 18. I can't think of my own daughter who grew up in my household always uh, and who were smart, capable young women now, but who would have been ready to be on their own at age 18. So when it comes to really taking a look at how to help people achieve what they can achieve, I think the, uh, the Family Unification Program and the Foster Youth for Independence Program are two just amazing place-based initiatives that uh, I hope more, um, more communities investigate further. All right, we're going to switch now to the uh, basic marketing and places to start um, slide. Okay, wow, that was fast. Yeah, pretty quick. Okay, so we're going to take a quick look. We have talked a little bit about uh, marketing, and in your handouts, you will see the full and complete um, marketing PowerPoint. I call it Beyond Bake Sales. <laughs> I know I got really clever with myself there for a little while, but uh, but it really is moving your mindset beyond bake sales. You yeah, bake sales are wonderful. I'll never complain with them, okay? But fundraisers are best at getting your name out to the public. That's what fundraisers do the very, very best. They rarely will bring in enough money to run your operation. So I'm not saying don't do fundraisers because I like them and they're important and they're fun and, you know, you can, you can have a, a, a lot of a good time doing fundraisers. But don't count on them. You need to learn to do something bigger, something stronger. And that's where marketing comes in. Okay, so let's take a look at some basic marketing tools that you can implement. Next slide, please, Sheree. All right, when you're, when you're starting to market, and, and those of you who have had some uh, business school education or even just taken a course or two, you're going to recognize some of this. You need to identify your customers. Now, for a lot of nonprofits, the, the first instinct is to say our customers are our service consumers, and that's true. Your customers are your service consumers. But you have other customers that you may not have started to think of as customers, and those are your funders or your investors, okay? They can be individual donors. They can be fundraiser contributors or participants. They can be local government. They can be lenders. They can be grantors, corporate, foundation, or federal. All right. So, um, so those are those are some additional customers that I would like you to kind of keep in mind as customers. Next slide, please, Shreya. So when you're, when you're doing marketing, what you want to do is you want to take a different marketing approach 
for the different customers that you're trying to get to either invest in your program or to use the services of your program. So you're going to address the customer priorities and offer, oh, you've heard me say this all week long, a return on an investment. Okay, and remember what I said, the investor in a nonprofit program is not usually looking for a financial return on investment. They are looking to have some kind of a need met that they've identified as a priority for their business or their government agency or whatever. Okay, so that's the outcome they're looking for. They don't particularly care how many people you serve. What they care about is what difference did it make that you did it. Next slide, please, Shirley. So you can start with a marketing study, and this can be thought of as your statement of need. What need is your product or service going to fill? What documentation can you show to confirm that there is, in fact, a problem? What documentation can you show to describe the extent of the problem? And what documented impact does the problem have on the target market priority? Okay, remember I said we're not going to talk about the impact it has on your agency. What impact does it have on the priority of the target market, which means that target market may have said it wants to see children reading at grade level. So that's their priority. So what is the impact that, your pro that that need is having on those children who are not reading at grade level? See how you need to phrase that? You need to phrase it so that it addresses the target market priority. Next slide, please, Ray. All right, define your product. What is it? Say it. Clarify it. You know, make sure that you can articulate it clearly and cleanly without confusion. Okay, and that means getting a lot of those extraneous words out. How will your product or service fix the problem? Has the problem ever been addressed before? If so, how is your approach different? You know, they, there's an old saying that if you build a better mousetrap, the world will be a path to your door. Well, that's a pretty old saying, but, it, but it's kind of true. If you can do something better than it's ever been done before, you're going to get the investment that you need to make it happen. You have to figure out how you're going to market it first. This goes back to our old friend, the logic model, which is your one-page marketing tool. Next slide, please. Please make sure that you've got coordination and cooperation going with your community. Okay, there, there, there should not be any lone rangers trying to do anything out there. You should always be working together as a team. Who else in your community or neighborhood or city or region is working to address the same issues that you are? What parts of the problem are you experts at addressing? And what parts are others experts at addressing? You need to develop a plan to work together. Now, I have had the question come to me many times, how do you get people to work with you? One thing that I have always found very successful, and it takes a little bit of discipline on your part, but I'm going to challenge you to try it. Call a meeting of all the likely partners to address a particular issue. Call a meeting, and it can be in these days a Zoom meeting, but call a meeting. And make sure that you have left your ego outside the door because this, this meeting has no room for your ego. Other people's egos may show up because you haven't warned them about it, but your ego needs to stay away. When you come into the meeting, Come in with the problem in hand. This is the need that I have identified in our community. This is the hole in the service system. And come in with the solution. This is what I think we can do about it. And then let your solution make its way all the way around the table or 
the Zoom screen or whatever it is you're using. Make, let every person in the meeting have a little input. Well, yeah, that's a pretty good idea. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Have you thought about this? Maybe by the time that solution makes its way back to you, it doesn't look quite like what you brought into the room. That's okay. The question is, will it work? Because if you, if you let everybody take a piece of it, remember just like allowing your service consumers to define what their goals are and what they're willing to do to get to them, if you let everybody in that room have a piece of that solution, they will invest in it. You are more likely to get the partners that you're looking for by allowing everybody to have a piece of the solution instead of walking into a room and saying, okay, here's the problem, here's what we're going to do, who is in with me? Uh, that's, you, you might not find as much cooperation as you need that way. Leave that ego outside, okay? Be willing to let some changes happen to your proposal so that the big picture goal of getting the, the need met, okay, can happen. Next slide, please. All right, for your target market, do your homework. All right, remember that you need to address the target market priorities and their desired returns on investment. How do you find what those are? We talked about that, we'll talk about it just a little bit more here at the end, but you go to their website. And somewhere on, the, on most corporate websites, it's gonna say how we're involved in our communities or what our community priorities are. It's going to be something like that that you're going to be able to key in on. It's part of learning, you know, the different forms that these same words can take, okay? Find out what their priorities are. If you have found a, uh, a corporate uh, donor, a corporate investor, whose priority is educational, and you provide services to people who um, maybe have substance abuse issues, it's probably not the right funding source for you. Don't try to bend somebody else to your will. Look for the funding source that matches what you do. If somebody sounds like a great funding source but it won't work for you, that's fine. Move on. If you know of someone who might be able to use that funding source, Tell them about it, okay? Use different forms of communication to reach different targets, okay? You might uh, try direct paper mailing and electronic social media. I will tell you this. I mentioned to you earlier that, that uh, I have a little snow on my roof, okay? So um, I am not maybe as tech savvy as my, my lovely colleague, Tadaya, is. Um, she's a lot of years younger than I am. So she grew up with tech that I had to learn as a second language. My first instinct is to kind of bypass all the solicitations that come into my email, you know, like delete, delete, delete. But if somebody sends me something in the mail, in paper mail, because I am of an age, I'll hang on to that. I'll put it in my slot that says I need to pay attention to this at some point in time. And I may not get a donation out this week or next week or the week after, but I have a piece of paper that's going to constantly be reminding me that I need to make a donation to these people. Believe me, our local food bank here knows that about me very, very well. They don't send me emails. They know better. They know I'm not going to respond well to emails because I get so many emails. But if they send me something in the mail, they're probably going to get a donation from me before very much longer goes by. Okay, so think about it. Who is your target market? You want to use direct paper mailings and electronic and social media. Use public service announcements. They are, by and large, uh, cost-free. Uh, now, I will say something about public service announcements, okay? They are um, they're free um, broadcast media announcements as a rule. And um, 
they tend to come on at a time when there's not much else filling the airwaves. So I, I tell the story, for years I had a geriatric Dalmatian who used to have to get up at 2.30 or 3 o'clock every morning to go outside because she was old and she had to, and you don't argue with something like that. Um, so I, I, you know, I'd get up with her and take her out to the backyard and, you know, while she was out there snuffling around and taking her time, I would look on the radio because I like radio and I'm old. Um, and I would hear public service announcements at 2.30 or 3 in the morning. So you don't rely on public service announcements is what I'm telling you. Use them by all means. Use them wherever you can get your name out to the public. You get your name out to the public, but you don't count on them for your marketing. Okay, but use them uh, um, unless you happen to, to be the owner of a geriatric foundation. You're going to hear it all the time, like I did. You know, you may not hear it enough. Uh, media support. Okay, get get media support going. I think I told you that, that I became, you know, a real popular speaker for our local United Way because I would take all the crazy hour um, presentations. You know, I would do that. And, and then I started getting calls from the local media asking about my area of expertise, which was homelessness. And then I became like the go-to guy for the media to ask questions about this. And if, you know, if somebody wrote an op-ed and they were, you know, coming down hard on the, the people sleeping on, you know, in tents in the, in the woods and, you know, the, the media would contact me and say, what do you say about this, Anne? And I would be able to get my agency's name in front of the community by discussing this situation and what the community could do, media support. Be somebody, be somebody on the media's go-to guide. Uh, business proposals and responsive applications, of course, of course, okay? Write business proposals. Make sure you include a good program plan. Make sure you also have that snapshot of your program, that logic model, to go with it in case somebody is busy or on their way to Japan and only has a minute to look at one thing, okay? But have a good business plan up and prepared, and you can always refine your business plan. The business plans are not engraved in stone. They're meant to be living documents. They can be refined. But you've got to get all these great ideas out of your head, and you've got to get them written down somewhere. Uh, and, of course, responsive application. If you hear about a funding source that is going to match up with what you do, then by all means, make the application. Do not, however, try and create something to match up the funding that you heard about. We can spot those a mile away. Make personal appearances and participate in meetings. Um, yeah, get out there. Talk to groups. As, as we get through the pandemic and we all get our vaccinations and we get, get out with people again, get out there and talk to groups. Make your organization's name and marvelous things you do known in your community. And participate in meetings. I used to laugh, um, but I would go to city council meetings and I would go to uh, the CDBG, of course, we call this the dog and pony show. Um, and, and I would, you know, go with my proposals. And, you know, I might have to sit for two and a half hours to be able to speak for five minutes. That was a long, long evening. That was a long evening. But you know what? It was worth it because I was there and others weren't. And because I was there, I was remembered. And of course, make face-to-face -face appointments. If you, if you have learned about a financial institution in your community that wants to start a financial literacy program, and this is something that your organization knows how to do, make a proposal, ask for an appointment, go in and talk to the people about it. You will be surprised how much the initiative is appreciated. But you want to do it in a very business-like manner. Next slide, please, Claire. 
point, let's talk about sustainability, which is future funding. Grant, and we said this earlier, grants are by definition a temporary funding source. An application must address the continuation of the program or project when the grant funds are no longer available. Remember that a grant is a contract, it's not a gift. It does not come to you in perpetuity, all right? Grants, like all contracts, are term limited. It might be two years, it might be renewable, it might not. So make sure that you're looking ahead. Future funding acknowledges that continued funding is identified and available, it demonstrates extensive contact, and it demonstrates that programs and projects have support for others. I know that's a redundancy from what I said yesterday, but it bears repeating because a lot of people throw all their eggs in one grant basket, okay? But uh, please make sure that you are looking ahead. Next slide, please, Shreya. When you're looking for funding, I want you to open your mind, really open your mind to a different perspective of this program. Look at it from some other angle or angle, okay? Consider each aspect of your program. Which funders might have a priority for each of the different parts that make up the whole program? Uh, I did, when I ran my nonprofit, cobble together more than one program in just this way, all right? I'm going to give you an example. This is a real program, by the way. It, it's no longer in existence, but it was a fabulous program while it was running. It was a school suspension alternative program. It's called Stay Up While You're Out, okay? It kept kids off the street, and they got Department of Juvenile Justice and the Department of Justice funding to help them. It tutored them. So they didn't fall behind in lessons. They got Department of Education funding for that. It provided them with life skills and work training through the Department of Labor. It fed them through the USDA Food and Nutrition Services, and it taught them conflict resolution and drug-free stress management. And that was funded, that piece was funded through Health and Human Services. So you can see this one program this school suspension alternative program, you know, so many kids get suspended from school, they end up behind, they go back, they're behind, they don't see how they're going to catch up. So what are they going to do? They're either going to skip school or they're going to just, you know, cause more problems and get suspended again. All right? Isn't it better not to let them lose that ground? That's what this program was about, and it was very, very successful program. Next slide, please. Don't be shy about asking an established program for advice. Many will be glad to help you get started, especially if they are in a different community. Even in a slow economy, there are resources available, and many of them are non-governmental. The work is to find the funders whose priorities match what your organization does. This funder's return on investment will be to make an impact on that particular issue or problem. Your organization can help the funder achieve his or her return on investment. Use that as your marketing lever. Next slide, please. Okay, we're going to look at some places to start. I'm going to walk you through these, okay? So you are going to get these slides and all of these websites. That's the official federal funding site www.grants.gov. Um, because I did this slide before we got the information about beta.gov, uh, I have the CFDA in here. Again, I, I don't find it particularly useful. Somebody suggested yesterday that beta.gov is a good website instead, so try that. There's also USAGov's nonprofit gateway. There's the Rural Assistance Center. Excellent, excellent website. Um, their federal agency department website, search for grants or funding. Next slide, please. All right, if you're, if you're, if you're working on a transportation project, the, these can be a little tricky and a little difficult. 
okay, go to the Federal Transit Administration, look at the Rural Transit Assistance Program. Uh, go to Community Transportation Associated, Association of America. They don't have funding, but they do have a lot of technical assistance to help you get your project going. And go to Job Link Employment Transportation, which also offers only technical assistance. But you know, through technical assistance is how you often will find your way to uh, investors. Next slide, please. Places to start rural, local, and state websites. The National Association of Towns and Townships. The Rural Information Center through USDA. The USDA Rural B Business Cooperative. Can you tell that I think highly of USDA as a partner? I do. And the Council on Foundations. And what I've discovered with the Council on Foundations is that virtually every state has a state council on foundation. So that might be worth your time to look at to see what foundations exist in your state and then drill it down. Next slide, please. Foundations and networks, okay? The Grantsmanship Center was mentioned. Uh, the Foundation Center and GuideStar has merged to an organization called candid.org. There's national and community service, and these are your, uh, your VISTA and AmeriCorps volunteer folks. There's the Network for Good. There's the Public Welfare Foundation. There's the Channing Vet Company. And there's the Sturdena Foundation. These are all foundations and networks, and there are many, many more. These are just the ones that jump out at me. Next slide, please. Corporate and foundation, new USA funding, uh, the Opportunity Finance Network. This is the one I was telling you about. I kept telling you it was Boston University, and I apologize for that. It's actually Boston College, which is a distinctly different educational institution, and whatever you do, don't mix them up because they are very different. But the Center for Corporate Citizenship, where I told you so many corporate, uh, big corporations have allowed their websites to be posted, and you can go and see, well, what are they doing that makes them good corporate citizens? The 3M Foundation has a uh, very good giving foundation. And the Aetna Foundation has a good foundation. Next slide, please. More corporate foundations. There's the Bank of America Foundation. Now, Wells Fargo giving community giving. Uh, I had a friend who, who was there community rep for years and years here. And I will never forget one time she came to me and she said, Ann, I have a problem. I said, really? What's the problem? And she said, I haven't received enough applications from nonprofits for the amount of money that I have to give to the Wells Fargo Foundation in this area. And I was, oh, well, I can help you with that problem. And so I put the word out and she was inundated with applications. But the point is, there are resources available. So take a look at what your major financial institutions are, are doing. Uh, the Anthem Foundation, okay, another insurance company foundation, AT&T Foundation. And if you're, if you're into children's wellness, this is one of my favorites, Kaboom. Kaboom helps build community playgrounds. And that is, in my opinion, a very wonderful thing to do. Next slide, please. Places to start for broadband and telecommunications. <clears throat> broadband USA. <clears throat> Excuse me, I got a little problem. So, the National Telecommunications and Information Agency. Okay, great, great resource. Everyone on who is the one that that was just a tremendous resource for Connect Home USA and and HUD Connect Home project. And uh, other high-speed internet resources, um, are there government programs to help me get internet service? Okay, look and see. And remember that one website will easily lead you to others. So don't be afraid to click, click, click. And if you find something that's good, bookmark it so you can find your way back to it. Because one of the things I run into is, is sometimes I'll, I'll chase myself down a rabbit hole and not be able to get back to where I was. 
So if you find something good, bookmark it so you can get back to it. Next slide, please. All right, uh, for STEM education, there's the National Education Association uh, for STEM, there's STEM Finity, and there's Inside Philanthropy that offers STEM education grants. We want our children to be as well educated and as competitive as they can possibly be going into the future. And that's gonna mean making sure that they are well educated with science, technology, engineering, and applied mathematics. You often, often will also hear this called STEAM. Okay, so please support, if, if this is something you do and you need support for it, then these are good places to look. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, other educational uh, programs, um, the U.S. Department of Education, of course, Get Ed funding and FundsNet services for education and literacy grants. You see that there's there's more out there than you might initially have thought, and you're not limited. You're not limited to saying, oh, I'm doing an education program. I have to go through the Department of Education. No, it's good to look and see what Department of Education is offering, but you're not restricted to the Department of Education. Let your brain roll around with this a little while and see what else you can come up with. Next slide, please. For arts and culture, and I hear a lot from people who, who are interested in finding funding for arts and culture programs, and I think arts and culture programs are extremely important. Uh, they, are, they are wonderful creative outlets. They are places where people can be who they are in safety. Uh, so I'm, I'm all for arts and culture funding. And here are a few things that I found. It's the National Assembly of State Arts Agency. There's ARC, A2Z, and then of course there is the Federal Government National Endowment for the Arts. There are probably many, many more that I haven't uncovered, but those are the ones I said that jumped out at me as I was putting this together. Next slide, please. For preservation, okay, please look at what the Environmental Protection Agency has to offer. And also the Pew Charitable Trust has a wilderness and public lands protection. Okay, take a look at that. Okay, it, it, is, it is very important uh, in this time of, of uh, climate change and the impacts that we're feeling from uh, some severe climate issues that we pay attention to preservation. So uh, please, if this is what you do, here's a couple of resources that you can start with. Next slide, please. Okay, places to start for housing. Um, of course, there's HUD, you, uh, HUD does. There's USDA Rural Development, which I, I tease, but it is not really true, but, but I call them like the rural HUD. They do develop housing and community facilities in rural communities. And they are, they, again, you know, USDA, one of my favorite fellow federal agencies. There's the Housing Assistance Council. There's the Aspen Institute. There's the Local Initiative Support Corporation, a fabulous national corporation that has many, many local chapters. And then there's a rural list, R-U-R-A-L, list, L-A-S-C. So places to start looking for housing development and housing programs. Next slide, please. All right, I often will get requests from Civic League, uh, which are uh, kind of quasi-nonprofit organizations. So I have done a little looking on behalf of Civic League. Um, there is a national civicleague.org. Um, a lot of this is technical assistance, but actually some of these have uh, grant programs that go with them. The city of Chesapeake here in Virginia has a very good uh, Civic League Development Guide, which is more technical assistance than anything else, but it's worth looking at. The U.S. Conference of Mayors has an annual Community Wings Award program uh, that, that it offers specifically. And I also found on the Georgia Municipal Association's grants page 
uh, a very good uh, grant and award opportunity program. So there's a place where civic leagues can start too. If you are working with a civic league or trying to get a civic league up and running in your community, um, take a look at some of these resources. And I believe that's my last slide, isn't it, Sherea? Sherea? Yes, that's yes, my last that slide. Is, that is my last slide. Wow, guys, you hung in there with me all the way through the week. I, you rock. You absolutely rock. Let me ask uh, Hidaya, do we have any questions that need responses? We do have some questions in, and I'm probably going to see the chat um, have a few more questions, but let's start with the ones that I have right now. Okay. Um, so someone says, how does the PFC Coalition get funding to provide technical assistance to nonprofits in our county? Okay, so again, I'm not 100% sure what the PFC Coalition is. Um, however, if you, if, uh, and I'm also not sure if you're saying you need technical assistance or you want to provide technical assistance, but if it's providing technical assistance is what you want to do then get the word out to your fellow uh, agencies that this is what you can offer and, uh, and talk to them about having a Zoom meeting where you can start to lay out if they need strategic planning assistance or if they need board training. Uh, if you need the technical assistance, then uh, work it the other way. Then send the word out to either your local um, nonprofit network if you have one, or if you don't have one, start to develop one. Uh, or if you're fortunate enough to have a uh, strong United Way in your community, um, put the word out. Say, you know, this is what we need. This is what we're looking for. Is there anyone out there who can provide it for us? You might also look at some of your uh, corporate uh, citizens in your community. Uh, particularly ones that, that might be accounting firms or financial institutions that might be able to uh, provide you with this kind of uh, technical assistance or partner with you on providing this kind of technical assistance to others. And also, don't forget, if you have uh, colleges or universities and even, even the, uh, the business administration programs of community colleges, uh, might be interested in working with you on something like this. Thank okay. you, Anne. This is a question I believe from earlier, maybe even before you started the presentation. Someone asked if you could clarify, and I believe this was about the Facebook-funded um, initiative. They said, right. did you say blackcommunityfunding.org? Yes, let me, let me take a quick look at that again. Okay, black community partnership fund.org. Now, that, that, may, clarification. that may just be the name of the one that's here in the Hampton Roads community, but what, what, uh, what it says is that uh, Facebook recognizes the Hampton Roads Community Foundation's commitment to racial equality, racial equity, and uh, chose to partner with us to support black-led nonprofits Thus, the Black Community Partnership Fund will help challenge and dismantle structural racism in our community. That's the Hampton Roads community. Go ahead and look at their website and see, see what they have, but also see what may be happening in your community, because Hampton Roads is all the way out here on the East Coast. So if you're in um, the middle of the country somewhere, or if you're on the West Coast, you may have to look for something like it. Thank okay. you, Ann. This next question, someone says, I missed the information um, on the chat regarding the government grants website and if you could repost it. Okay, I did repost it um, a little bit later on. Um, look at approximately 312. There is a posting okay. from, from me to all attendees. HUD's highest scoring funding applications, the last one's added from 2014, and there is the website there. But if you've missed it, just go to the HUD website and go to the bottom 
where the smaller print stuff is and click on the FOIA, F-O-I-A, it stands for Freedom of Information Act. And then click on, when you get to the FOIA website, click on the frequently requested materials and you'll have, uh, you'll be able to see HUD's highest scoring funding application. Thank you, Anne. Someone is requesting that you provide them the link to become an Opportunity Zone in the chat. Uh, I do not have a link to become an Opportunity Zone, but there is a link for more information about Opportunity Zones. Uh, remember that uh, your governor is the one who determines where the Opportunity Zones are in your state. So what I would do if I were you is go to your state um, housing finance agency or community development at the state level and see what they have in opportunity zones. Or just put, say if, if, if you're in Kansas, put uh, opportunity zones Kansas and see what comes up. And you will then, I mean, here in Virginia, you know, we have, we have a good opportunity zone website um, that, that comes up that has an interactive map and we can see where the opportunity zones are. We can see where the uh, opportunity zone investors are. So I'm thinking that other states will have the same thing. Uh, thank you, Ann. Um, sorry, my dog is up early today, but I will, hopefully he doesn't make too much noise. This next question says, can a nonprofit be affiliated with multiple place-based initiatives such as Section 3 and Envision Centers, or is that something you create for your own organization? Uh, I think that you could be affiliated with multiple ones. In fact, I think it's a very good idea to, uh, we like to see the place-based initiatives dovetailing with each other. So uh, I'm, I'm all about uh, getting Connect Home organizations to get, your, get, get the folks who use their broadband connected with the Section 3 Opportunity Zones to, to increase their opportunities of getting hired by Section 3 businesses. And I'm all about the Envision Centers looping in a Connect Home project and, um, and you know, yeah, I think that's a great idea to, to dovetail that way. Um, if you do not have a place-based um, project going in your community right now that you're aware of, contact one of the place-based people, um, one of the place-based uh, links that are on that, on that presentation, that first presentation we did today, and, uh, and find out, you know, where, where, is the near, where are the nearest ones to me? Uh, Ramel, who is on this uh, presentation today, and, and he'll be saying goodbye to us here at the end, um, he works with the Envision Center project out of headquarters. Uh, Dina Lehman Kid works with Connect Home, or Dina Lehman Kim works with Connect Home. Okay, um, and and there's you know uh, we have regionally people who are working with Section Three, so we can get you connected uh, to to opportunities in your area. And I uh, yeah, absolutely dovetail. Uh -huh. Thank you for that, and. This next question says, when calling a meeting with partners to collaborate on the grant, let's say working with at-risk youth, what happens when they veer off to write the grant themselves? Um, hopefully, hopefully you wouldn't have that level of rudeness happen. Um, you know, I don't see why they would. If you, if you come in with the, with the issue and you come in, you know, with a solution, and you're clear that that you're looking for partners here. I I, I can't imagine why they would go off and write that themselves. This is not something you do for big open grins. Writing grants is hard. So, uh, but but if they do, you know, you can. I would say go back to them and say, hey, remember that meeting we had? I want to work with you on this. I want to be your community partner on this. Yeah, don't let a partnership die. Remember that egos are very intractable. intractable, intractable. Um, they're there, and they don't like to, to go into hiding very easily. Uh, but it is important. Uh, I have always told partners that I've worked with, you have to decide 
is it more important to get the job done or to get the credit? You know, that's, that's your option. And if it's more important to get the job done, then you need to work together as a team. Thank you. And next question, does HUD provide funding to establish and operate Envision Center? Uh, HUD, Envision Centers are not a funded project. We will provide you with, uh, with support, with technical assistance. Um, we have a, a team in, here in Virginia that has just been tremendously supportive of our Envision Centers, uh, but I am not aware of any funding that's going into Envision Centers. Thank you. And uh, the next question, if you have a program that relies on funding from various sources, how does that affect the application process? Well, it's uh, multi-applications, I would say, if you're getting funding from different sources. You remember going back to our budget form, how we put down uh, the revenue source was from the grant, and it was from our pocket, and it was from a third party, okay? And it all, it all covered one line item on the budget, but it came from three different places. So that is kind of how that works. Uh, obviously, you're making more applications, um, but you, this is where you go back and you, uh, you make a table that, that says very clearly, this grant has these regulations, it lasts for this period of time, this is what we can spend the money on, and make a good clear table so that when you look at it, you can make sure that you are staying in compliance with each of those funding sources. Thank you, Anne. The next question says, you mentioned the Aspen Institute. When searching just now for housing on their website, none of their pages came up in the results. Do you have an exact link for their housing initiative? Let me see. I uh, didn't have, yes, AspenInstitute.org. No, that's, that's all I have. Thank you, Ann. Um, the next question is, do you apply to all of the agencies with the same program plan? No. You have to, you have to target your market. So if you're applying to different agencies for different aspects of the program, you highlight the aspects of the program that that agency funds, and you explain how, how that piece of the program is uh, integral to the whole. But you no, know, you do not boilerplate anything ever. Thank you. And next question is, how do you get more people to respond to your business? Do you, sorry, do you just post flyers you might have answered this question already. Um, if you're talking about a nonprofit business, how do you get more, uh, more people to respond? If you're talking about providing services, uh, you would have needed to have done a needs assessment to find out if those services are needed because if, if, uh, if they're needed, then you can reach out to other uh, organizations that might make referrals for you so you get yourself established. Okay, if you're talking about organizations that need to respond to funding your organization to making an investment, that's where you get into the other part of the marketing, which is to, uh, to find out what's important to that investor and, and how is what you're doing reflective of what's important to that investor. Thank you, Anne. The next question is, what's the best way to reach out to HUD for support in seeking connections or sources for capacity, funding, or funding online or both uh, phone or online? Well, remember that this, this um, set of webinars and the slides and the handouts are going to be posted to HUD Exchange uh, in the next three weeks or so. So there's certainly one place. I think you can reach out to uh, Ramel, 
uh, and he can connect you with people uh, in your office, or Jill Yu, um, who is another person in the HUD field policy and management who worked with us to get this set up, uh, can connect you with people in your field office. Uh, reach out to your nearest HUD field office, uh, to, the, uh, to the field office director's uh, area, which is field policy and management, and see if they have anyone who can uh, help you connect with some of the people that can assist you with this. Um, larger HUD offices are going to have a little more staff that might be able to help. Smaller HUD offices may not be able to help. And that's when we reach back to our headquarters team. Thank you, Anne. The next question is, since you answered all the questions all week, did anyone record the questions and answers for reprint on our email? I don't know if they're recorded for reprint, but I know they're part of the recording for the uh, webinar. So if you go back and click on the dates of the webinar, you'll hear the Q&As at the end. Because Thank the recording you. doesn't recording recording's not ending until we say we're done. Thank you, Ann. Um, this might be the last question. Someone says, I am very passionate about providing housing options and or vocational opportunities for youth aging out of foster care. Yay. I am not <laughs> I am not affiliated with an agency and have never worked in this field. Where should I start? Um, you've never worked in the field, so uh, you really need to start educating yourself about the situation, about what's happening with youth aging out, about what the, uh, what the need is in your state and in your community. You probably have somewhere at the state level uh, some kind of a commission on youth. Most states do. That would be a good place to start getting information to understand the need. Once you have your, your hands around the need and you can get it down on paper and document the need, then you can go to your local housing authorities and say, this is a need that I've documented. Here's a program that I'm aware of that HUD has. Would you be interested? Can we work together as partners on this? Thank you. And I think if you're referring to the Foster Youth Initiative, Anne, I believe uh -huh. that, that Child Protective Services uh, needs to be looped in with the agency that's receiving uh, Foster Youth Initiative vouchers. And someone can check me on that, but I believe right. that is what I'm uh, Certainly the local Department of uh, Social Services or Human Services uh, needs to be engaged in that. And that's a, ne that's a necessary partner. But working, but but learning about the situation, getting your hands on the on uh, around the need, getting that need documented, and then going to your housing authority, and you know you can also go to your Department of Health and Human Services or whatever it is they call themselves in your community. But that's where you get started with things like that. Thank you for that information. This next question is, I am interested in doing financial literacy and youth entrepreneurship. Can you tell me where I can start? I'm not sure about the youth entrepreneurship part, although I would certainly recommend that you contact your local small business administration and see if they have some resources you can tap into uh, for technical assistance at the very least. Um, but in terms of financial literacy, the FDIC has a really good program called Money Smart, and they will train people to provide financial literacy training. Um, and I would, I would go to the FDIC's website and see if there is a Money Smart program near you uh, or, if there's, or if you can apply for a Money Smart training program and get yourself, get yourself trained as a financial literacy counselor so that you can actually um, launch a program like that. Thank you, Anne. As a follow-up to that, someone says, um, or I don't think that's a follow-up, I'm sorry. Do HUD or government agencies give to faith-based organizations? Do HUD or federal agencies do what? Give to? Faith-based organizations. Yes, we do. 
Um, we, we provide grant funding to them, and remember that that's not a gift. That's contract, okay? So certainly faith-based organizations are welcome to apply for uh, competitive grant funding, uh, keeping in mind that the uh, faith-based organization must be able to separate its inherently faith-oriented activities, like church services and prayer and stuff like that. It has to be able to separate that from the service it's provided. So basically what that means is you can still have those things, but they have to be in either a different time than your human service that you're providing with the funding or a different place than the human service that you're providing with the funding so that the people who are coming to you for service don't feel compelled to participate in your faith activities. That's, you know, we, we just can't support that. But certainly you as a faith community uh, are, are totally eligible to apply for funding as long as you can keep your inherently faith activities separated in either time or place. Thank you, Ann. They, as the follow-up to that is actually, is there a list for them on the web? A list for, no, no, because, because there's not any specific faith grant that we put out. You would be eligible to apply for any other grant that any other nonprofit organization is eligible to apply for. Um, as long as you have the capacity to implement the program you say you're going to implement. It's just that one caveat that you need to have it separate in time or place. So, I mean, you can use the same fellowship hall for, um, for housing counseling services as you use for your, um, your Wednesday night worship. You just can't do it at the same time. And you can you you can you can have your housing counseling services going on at the same time as your Wednesday night worship services, just not in the same place. Thank you, and um, those are the end of the questions. I did just want to add a quick note because you plugged um, university students uh, as potential interns for many of these nonprofits. Uh, just a, on a personal account, um, when I was a grad student, I interned for Catholic Charities, and it was a really good experience, um, especially once we had developed a work plan for me. So, um, yeah, I definitely recommend, especially if you have a work plan, um, go recruit from college campuses. So, Absolutely. Um, college students are some of my favorite people, and I'm still, I still hear from some of the college students who interned with my nonprofit more than 22 years ago before I came to work for HUD. So I, I hope that, that it would be a good experience and, and something that, uh, that you take advantage of because, wow, what young people bring to an organization is priceless. Um, I, I thought that was the last question, but last question came in at 445. Can we look for more training on this subject? I don't know. Um, let's, let's get this posted. Let's get this webinar posted. And then um, certainly you could go to uh, the, non, the Center for Nonprofit Management, the Center for Nonprofit Excellence. You can go to the Grantsmanship Center. You can go to a lot of different places to get more technical assistance. Um, and, uh, and there uh, are probably people that can assist you at HUD or that can connect you to folks at HUD. I will tell you this, in HUD's um, Faith and Opportunity Initiative Office, uh, we have a wonderful uh, person uh, by the name of B.J. Douglas who uh, wrote a great guide um, for helping nonprofits get started. I believe that's posted on the website for HUD Faith and Opportunity Initiative Office. So um, that's a place where you can look. Um, but yeah, get, um, get this under your belt. Get, get moving with this. And please, I will say this. Let us know when you start getting funding, 
even if it's only a little bit, even if it's $500 or $1,000, let us know that you are starting to find success because let's face it, that's our outcome. <laughs> we we got to report on our outcomes and that's our outcome is your success. Um, they're asking how do we let you know and people are asking if there will be surveys or um, any kind of opportunity to have an evaluation and maybe Ramel can provide some closing remarks and address that. Yes, let's let Ramel jump into that. Great, thank you so much, Hidaya and Anne. Um, so on behalf of the Hutt family, we really appreciate Anne and Hidaya's willingness and flexibility to offer these trainings on a remote platform uh, to our wonderful HUD staff and community partners. As a, a former nonprofit advocate myself, I understand the importance of these uh, free trainings to you know, really better serve our communities at large, especially the communities that HUD um, serves. We wish Anne a very wonderful, amazing, well-deserved retirement. Uh, thank you for offering this training as a parting gift um, you know, to all of us. Uh, thank you to our participants and our amazing event producers. Um, again, these recordings and materials will be posted on the HUD Exchange page in about three weeks. Uh, please stay safe, healthy, and uh, have a great weekend. Um, in regards to the evaluation, uh, we um, fortunately do not have the capacity to, um, to do an evaluation or to do surveys, but um, hopefully in the future we will. Thanks, Ramel. And um, if, if you want to send messages, uh, I'll still be at HUD through the 29th of January. I can be reached at anne .davis at hud .gov. Hidayah can be reached at hidaia .a .salem at hud .gov. And Ramel, do you have a middle initial? Um, I don't, but you can just email envisioncenter at hud.gov. Um, there you go. And we can definitely just, um, you know, we'll provide you the information, uh, and, and hopefully we can answer your questions. We'll, we'll do our best to get to all of them. So we're not leaving you hanging. There are people you can turn to. Thank you all very much. Have a lovely, lovely long weekend, and uh, we will see you all another time. Thank you, Ann. Ms. Soraya, that's it. We're done. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using AT&T Event Services. You may now disconnect.